Welcome. My name is Kristen Tollefson. I'm the Education Director here at the Bainbridge Island Museum of Art. And uh, we're delighted that as many of you made the time shift and got everything lined up to be here today for a panel presentation we're calling Ties That Bind. We are so pleased to be able to partner with the Collins Library again and um, continuing to nurture that relationship with another organization that puts at the forefront of its existence artist books. And um, I, I was thinking about the audience that was going to be here today and how, you know, you're really, I, I don't need to give a lot of background information for most of you about what's going on here, but uh, the fact that there are artist books that are being celebrated so thoroughly in this region is uh, just, it keeps unfolding. It's it's this flower that keeps unfolding and people keep becoming drawn in to the conversation surrounding all the things that those items can be and the practice and the thoughts that are going into this work. So um, I just want to acknowledge that it's a tremendous thing that's happening here. And um, thank you, Jane. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, thank you, everybody who's in the audience who's doing some work, or as a friend of mine says, who's pulling the thread uh, of artist books. So um, today we are going to, I'm, we're, this was meant to be very informal. It already feels formal here with the lineup and the, uh, the microphones, but um, Jane and I are going to kind of bookend and volley back and forth with questions for Adele and Lucy. And um, so we have here Lucy Childs and Adele Patrick, and um, we're going to give a little introduction. Jane Carlin. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, can you all hear me? Yeah. Great. Um, it's so great to see so many friends from yesterday in the front row and so many of you here this morning. And I am thrilled to be back here in one of my favorite places in the world, the Bainbridge Island Museum of Art. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> uh, when we first started to talk about collaboration, um, no pun intended, but we really wanted to weave threads together from the South Sound to the North Sound. And it's so wonderful that we have a connection with BIMA and with the South Sound and the Puget Sound book artists. Currently at Collins Memorial Library, we have a show called All Stitched Up. And I just would be curious, a show of hands, how many of you have been to that show? Great. Um, for those of you that haven't, I hope after today that you'll be intrigued. It's going to be on display in the library until December 11th, and I'd be happy to work with any of you that want to bring groups down for a tour. I'm sure many of our local artists might be willing to come in and talk with you. In addition to All Stitched Up, we also have an incredible stitching show called Interwoven Stories as well as a political art show that I'm going to talk about in a little bit called Tiny Pricks. And I'm thrilled to introduce Dr. Adele Patrick. Um, Adele and I met two years ago in London at a conference. I was presenting on artist books as catalysts of social change, and Adele was my speaker. And I've told many of you already, when I got the itinerary, I thought, I have to look up Adele Patrick just to make sure I knew what I was getting into. And when you Google her, there are pages and pages and pages of accolades and articles on Adele. And one of the first was that she was given the wonderful honor of being named the Scotswoman of the Year for her, yay! <laughs> Adele trained as a textile and embroidery artist at the famed Glasgow School of Art, and I'm sure she'd be very uh, welcome to answer questions about the status of that school right now after the, after the many fires. But more importantly, Adele has been an advocate for her community, uh, for women, for underrepresented voices. She is co-founder of the Glasgow Women's Library, which really is a misnomer because it's a library, a museum, an archive, a place of refuge, and a place of creativity. She arrived on our campus on Wednesday. I was super impressed because she flew from Glasgow to Reykjavik to SeaTac 
but she had only just landed from Nairobi on Monday. Um, <laughs> during the last year, Adele has been the recipient of something called the Claude Leadership Fellowship, which is quite a prestigious fellowship for arts leadership. And she's been talking to students and faculty on the campus of University of Puget Sound about how important it is to bring creatives, all of the people that are in this room, to administration and to boards and to leadership opportunities. So I'm really thrilled to have Adele here. Please join me in welcoming her. Um, in addition, we have Lucy Childs right here to my left. Um, Lucy is an artist living and working in the Bay Area who um, came into her work um, starting in the 70s after um, a degree at California, California College of Arts and, Arts and Crafts. And crafts. Um, her work spans artist books, sculpture, um, stitched fine work that is fine art as well. And um, what I love about her work is the way that it uses um, the metaphors that are so rich in artist books and stitching to really bring forth the, the message um, using borders and boundaries and um, mapping and defining lines and, um, and then also pushing agendas and um, questioning uh, a lot, um, instructing as well. So um, Lucy has brought some work today and um, can we just jump right in? Absolutely. Or, okay. Uh, so you've brought a few examples of your work, and can you share a little bit about your process? I can, and I'm going to come down and okay. literally really share. Um, um, I'm going to give you a microphone. This reminds me of anybody's of the generation, the old Martins and they would come out and they'd swing their... <laughs> yes, oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, oh, there we go. Okay. Anyway, um, what I did was I began... I always... I love crumpled paper. I love the sculptural nature of it. And I thought, what would it be like to just sew the edges? So I thought, you know, I'm going to do that. And so I just started doing that and I thought... I had gotten a product in this box, and it came with this wonderful uh, paper, crumpled already. And I thought, you know what, I'm just going to make the box into a book. And so I still have my label, which I uh, stitched on. I took the side of the box and made it sort of a spine. And then I included the paper that um, came around the object that I had ordered and was delivered and so forth. And so I was still playing with uh, bookmaking, but I had started doing stitching too. And then I went to linen. And um, what I did was, I'm sorry this is a little hard to see, but I, I crumpled the linen I sewed along the edges of the, the um, crumpling, like I did here. And my husband said, my goodness, it really has a sort of uh, map of, of geography look to it. So I was thinking about that. But what I was also thinking about was the samplers that girls and uh, young women uh, made to learn uh, letters and words and Bible passages and so forth. And I found one saying that said, Hail, specimen of female art. And that was on a sampler from 1798 by uh, Annie uh, Rickey. And I thought, you know, an early example, I'm sorry, an early example of women recognizing their artistic potential and having to proclaim it because nobody else was. <laughs> and this one here, so, I'm sorry, we just did that one. This one over here says, um, let's see, the needle in the book we find help to accomplish all female kind. And again, Rebecca Scott, 1790. So another early recognition of 
You know, women as artists, women as accomplishers, and women as um, needing to proclaim, needing to put their voice out there. I did um, this one, which has a sort of beach scene. I'm going to hold it up a little bit. And the beach scene is, you can see a lot. Do you mind holding this for a second? Just hold it sort of so I can talk. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, the beach scene is, um, I use a lot in my Quiet Island series. And Quiet Island is the, the place we all need to go when we're stressed. It's where uh, we need to go for solace and quiet. And the poem that goes with this is the Emma Lazarus poem, The New Colossus. Thank you so much. And The New Colossus uh, by Emma Lazarus, written in um, uh, 1883, is on the Statue of Liberty. It's on a, the plaque on the Statue of Liberty. And the words that I included are, um, sorry, I. Um, the state and, and my allergies are just, and my allergy medicine are not like coalescing, but so, so I do apologize. But anyway, the words that you're all familiar with that the, the Statue of Liberty is saying to all the immigrants coming in, she says, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched, refuse of your teeming shore. She's referring to, you know, uh, shores other, of course, than, than here in the United States. Send these the homeless, tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door, the door of entry. And um, it is not only to me about um, people needing to migrate, as, as people have done forever for reasons of um, drought or now climate change or war. But it's also the metaphor that we see in a lot of fairy tales and uh, religious stories and uh, myths of the stranger and welcoming the stranger. You never know who the stranger is. And in many fairy tales, the stranger is the person who, when you give them food and when you give them welcome, gives you three wishes or gives you, you know, bounty for the rest of your life. And if you ignore the, the stranger, as the wicked sisters do in some of the fairy tales, and they, instead of seeing the promise of the strangers, see this bedraggled, old, haggard, haggy, haggard uh, uh, ugly person and say, oh, I'm not going to do anything for you. And so they get not the wishes, but the, um, the ill effects of that. Anyway, so with this piece, I stitched across the, um, the beach scene the, those words of Emma Lazarus, those welcoming words. And just finally, if I have time enough, I don't know. Do I have a moment for another piece? I don't have to. Yeah. Yeah? OK. Just really quickly, I did this um, piece. Uh, it's, again, a poem. I was explaining to uh, a gentleman earlier this morning. It's a poem written for a woman uh, in 1932 who had come to Baltimore from Germany. And she was a Jewish woman escaping the perils of Germany of the time. And she um, was very distressed because she needed to leave her ill mother. And uh, she was living with Mary Elizabeth Fry. And Mary Elizabeth Fry wrote this poem, apparently just dashed it off. And it's a poem you've heard. And I took the lines of the poem and stitched them across. And the poem, which many of you have heard, I'm sure, is do not stand at my grave and weep. I am not there. I do not sleep. I'm a thousand winds that blow. I am the diamond glints on snow. I'm the, the sunlight on ripened grain. I'm the gentle autumn rain. And when you awaken in the morning's hush, I am the swift uplifting rush of quiet birds and circled flight. I am the soft stars that shine at night. Do not stand at my grave and cry. I am not there. I did not die. And 
it's not only a response to mourning, uh, literal mourning of someone passing who you uh, love and adore, but it's, I think it's, it's also a, a, some optimism of, you know, our times are changing. And it's just, I think it's a, it's a comment, commentary on the ongoingness. It's a, it's a bit of optimism towards the future. So I'm happy afterwards to, you know, if anybody has questions about these or want me to, or want to just come up and look, please do. So thank you, everybody. On a slightly different note, um, looking at the audience and looking at the books upstairs and looking at the books and all stitched up, there's a preponderance of women. And stitching has always been related to the history of women. When we opened All Stitched Up in Tacoma, we had a speaker, Dr. Anna Wagger, talk about Mae Morris, who was one of the first subversive stitchers in the early part of the, or later part of the 19th century. I think it's really wonderful that we have Adele here, who really, her work has been to advocate for women. At Glasgow Women's Library is almost 30 years old, correct? That's right. So yes. can you tell us a little bit about what is the library, what are the origins, and more importantly, how do you work as an arts advocate in your community um, to be sure to raise the voices of those that are often unheur unheard? Thanks very much for that lovely introduction, and oh, it's just so amazing spending time with Lucy and with so many incredible creatives and curators and, and groups and organizations here. Um, and there's lots of uh, synergy with um, the work that's taking place in, in Glasgow. Um, but I think um, I've been thinking about this idea of, of community a lot while I've been here, but also over the, the last few months as part of the the fellowship that you mentioned, Joan, and um, I think frequently um, the institutions that have evolved over the years, some of them might have a similar origin story to the origin story for the Women's Library, which is very much, you know, there was no borders between uh, those of us who were active in developing this particular initiative and the community, you know, one and the same. So maybe for the first 10 years, uh, we were all volunteers, all firebrand feminists, sort of like railing against uh, the system and so on, and, and it forged a passion and a desire to sort of develop. Um, but I suppose that lots, lots of institutions that have got a different origin story um, have, over the period of the incubation of the Women's Library, the 30 years, have been turning more to the sort of idea of like who is not represented here in the collections, who is not on our board, not in our staff team, and so on and so forth. So there's been a really interesting sort of like sweet spot, really, that we've arrived at in, in Women's Library over the last wee while, where we've been trying to keep the focus pulled on this sort of like community ownership, for want of a better term, and making sure that we're getting more and more and more um, alive to the barriers that there might be for people participating, people going on boards, people, you know, learning and using our space. So I suppose getting more and more interested to hear, you know, who might the go-to people be for us? You know, if we don't have uh, people who are part of the demographic of Scotland, absolutely and utterly feeling like the library's their own, then what do we need to do to sort of make sure that that changes to sort of widen the ownership. But in the meantime, our big sister and brother organisations have been going through their own sort of like trajectory. So we're sort of keeping that community live and, and widening it, but at the same time sort of professionalising. So we're now sort of like a staff cohort of 26. We've got 100 volunteers. There's been a lot of change uh, happening uh, in terms of recognition of what we're trying to do, which is amazing, but um, we're trying to sort of professionalise. Meantime, our big sister and brother organisations, the national galleries and so on and so forth, are almost like asking to have conversations with organisations like our own now to sort of say, how do you ensure, you know, how can we 
make sure that the, the almost like the community engagement side of it is not a siloed activity or a, a sort of like part of the education, but actually not impacting on the structural changes of organisation. So I think it's a really incredible time to be involved in an institution, but involved in looking at the ways that creatives can help that process of, with their agency, help the process of engagement that we all are now actively trying to sort of pursue. I'm not saying that we're pushing at an open door with every institution, <laughs> but, um, you know, I certainly feel like it's been a bit of a revolutionary period over the the gestation of, of the organisation I'm involved in. Not least to say that, yeah, there's been something called the internet brewing <laughs> exactly <laughs> over that period as well. So for those of us who have been involved in libraries and classification and communication and so on, um, there's been that to contend with as well, with all the pros and cons that are involved in, in that. Yesterday you mentioned a program uh, specifically directed at refugee women and how they created models of the homes that they left. Yes. That really was intriguing to me. Can you tell us a little bit more about that project? Yes, I suppose um, the She Settles and the Shields project, which you can have a we look at if anybody's interested on, on our website. Um, I suppose it sort of typifies the type of problem solving that my colleagues have had to do in terms of thinking, you know, the, the demographic in Scotland's changing. Happily, we've got um, lots of refugee and asylum seeker people choosing, or maybe not choosing, but be finding themselves in Scotland. Uh, a fairly inhospitable sp place, I imagine, on a lot of different registers, not least because it's freezing cold and dark most of the time, and, you know. <laughs> um, but, yeah, um, our population in Scotland is actually diminishing which makes the whole Brexit hot mess. Um, quite a difficult thing, because Scotland, we didn't vote for Brexit because we want people to choose to live with us and form our community. So for new citizens, uh, we had new citizens coming into our neighborhood. And also, we recognized, we started to do a bit of research about what was there in the big sister and brother organizations, the Mitchell Library, the biggest reference library in Europe is in Glasgow. What was there there that recorded women's lived experience of coming to Scotland and Glasgow from the 1940s, 50s onwards? And there was nothing, 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 nothing at all. So we had quite a lot of elders, lots of remarkable women who had made a journey from Lahore in 1950 with their chapati plates, with their wedding gowns, with it, you know, and, and had brought these objects with them and, you know, and, and had stories to tell, but there was, you know, those stories were just going to disappear. So we had the classic issue in the library. How do you meaningfully engage with people to ask them to contribute their stories for everybody's benefit? What would the motivation be there? And how might people who are not necessarily using their local library because possibly don't feel invited to do so or encouraged to do so, how could you get them involved in that storytelling which is at the beaten heart of any archive, museum and library? So as Jane says, we um, uh, inevitably we just think creatives. How could creatives work with us on this? So we employed a really brilliant woman artist called Sadia Gull, who we'd already got really good links with a lot of the South, South Asian women and women's groups in, in Glasgow. And she went out and worked with a whole bunch of really fabulous women, uh, a lot of elderly women. And we decided instead of just interviewing them and asking them and, and recording it, we asked them to build a composite of the memory of their house, the house that they left 40 or 50 years before. And it was great because it involved them, you know, getting stuck in and creating this beautiful model house, basically. Mm -hmm. What I should say is that in the course of making that, we were recording them saying, that's where we used to keep the grain store, that's where the animals were, that's where my mum and dad, like, you know, and, and big arguments and, you know, like really fantastic mm. stuff. But what's the, the amazing thing that I didn't mention yesterday is that 
we've got the model house now. We had a fabulous exhibition at Tramway that included a lot of these objects that women had brought all those years before. So it's just an incredible privilege that they would loan, loan those to us. Um, but what's been amazing is that it's now an exhibit in the library, it goes to schools, it's done the round, you know, for the last few years. But we'd find groups of people, women who had Chinese heritage, coming into the library and saying, oh, that looks like my home. That, you know, and then women from the Hebrides up north in Scotland coming and saying, oh, that looks a bit like my granddad's croft. I remember, you know, it's like this sort of like template for living, you know. And so the things that you learn, I suppose, through listening, but through that alchemical involvement of an artist, put an artist in the mix, and I feel like really magical things happen. Um, anyway, enough mm, waffling thank about you. that. Thank you. I, I love that you are talking about this as such an expansive exercise that um, you're looking to see who's not included. You're looking to daylight these stories that maybe um, may have been covered over or excluded and people whose cultures or stories may have been excluded. And I think that that is one of the really lovely and powerful things about this, this genre and um, that, it, that it has that power to bring things to the surface. And Lucy, uh, in your work, you talked a little bit about this, but um, how do these personal narratives surface for you in your work? And how do you, I mean, what is the process that you come to to daylighting these stories? And I noticed also that some of your books have this little first aid cross on them yeah, yeah. and um, that that kind of is part and parcel of this whole thing. It's, it's bringing up something very soft mm -hmm. in a very powerful and meaningful way. So I'd love you to talk a little bit about Thank you. your thought process. I, um, I, have, oh, pardon me. I have to say I don't have a very specific answer to your question. Uh, the the cross is hang on one second let me just okay the cross is just an uh, I think a beautiful shape in itself each of the um, the extending parts are all the same length and it reminds me of the red cross cross that you see which has that wonderful symbol of healing and if you need healing come to where you see the cross. So it doesn't have, for me, a very a specific uh, meaning, except that, except for that, it's just sort of, uh, it's a welcome. I don't, um, when I do my artwork, it's very intuitive, and I work with things that I'm drawn to. I don't, and I thought, um, uh, for, since I was a youngster, I always liked fairy tales and I always liked myths and I like a religious story. So those things, you know, carry through, but more in an intuitive way, not a not a specific way. I don't, I don't think um, of a specific story and want to uh, uh, illustrate or or talk about that. Um, Quiet Island, I think, is just a response to these times that regardless of your political stance, it's just, you know, climate change and the despair. I live down at Ed and I live in the Bay Area and, and it's a place where it's uh, a relief to come up here because it's so much calmer and there it's intense a lot. It's uh, intense because of the the income disparity is in your face all the time it's a very expensive place to live it's a place with uh with the, you know the tech people coming in or pushing other people out so even though we've lived in our house for 20 years we felt the tech you know uh, and i hope i don't offend anyone but there's a kind of down there at any rate an elitist you know get out of my way because here i come fail so and on the freeways, people drive it at literally 80 or 90 because it's just, I mean, it's an intense place to live. So, uh, but regardless of where you live, we all need a quiet island. We all need respite. And I think quiet island, uh, you know, for the, the Me Too movement, you know, people, women need quiet island. You need a, 
a, a space in your emotional life where you think, my God, I'm safe. You know, I can leave my house unlocked, literally or metaphorically even. Um, you know, uh, in, in my imagining of Quiet Island, there's, there's disputes among the residents, but they're resolved. And, and if you have a dispute with someone you're friends with, you always, you notice that your relationship is deepened. So that's what happens on Quiet Island. So I'm not sure I'm directly answering your question, but they, it's, my artwork is just, I've been making, doing art since I was a youngster, and I've had the experience, and I think other artists have this too, where you, you keep your notebooks of ideas, and you write down something, and you think, oh my God, that is just, uh, that is a killer idea. And then if you look back at your notes from 10 years before, you see the same idea, or you look at your artwork from 30 years before, and you think, oh my heavens, that's an idea that just stays with me. So, yeah, I, I think, um, I hope that answers some of your, your question. I hope that was clear. I saw some nods, so that, that enduring idea, I think, is similar for people. Lucy, yesterday you described driving on the freeway and going to Quiet Island. Oh, God, and yes. last night after the symposium, I was laying in bed, and I went to Quiet Island. Oh, that's <laughs> good. Yeah. So thank you for that. Oh, good. I'm, yes. I'm going to kind of step out of my facilitator role for just a second and talk to you about the Tiny Pricks Project. Um, just a show of hands, how many are you, of you are familiar with Tiny Pricks? So a fair number of you. <laughs> I love saying that. I can't. The students at Puget Sound get a kick out of it. Um, I do want to tell you that this is a project that has really uh, taken on an international movement, and it was created by Diana Waymar. Uh, Diana is an artist from British Columbia, and as I mentioned earlier, we have some of her work on display at the University of Puget Sound. She came to our campus uh, right after the election of Donald Trump for a project that we called Refashioning Identity. And in that project, several members of the community, and I think if you're if you participated in refashioning identity, please raise your hand. Um, we participated by stitching pages that um, shared meaningful uh, ways of looking at our life. And that project became part of a larger project that Diana had created called Interwoven Stories, which has an international following as well. And those pages are on display at the University of Puget Sound. But as Diana was working on Interwoven Stories, she was deeply affected by the political situation. And to paraphrase her comments from a lecture on Friday night, when our president tweeted, I am a very stable genius, for her, she felt that was, she couldn't let that go. And I believe that, and those of you that heard Diana, please chime in, that she had had a yellow cushion from her grandmother, cushion cover that she was just holding on to and wondering what to do. And she, she stitched, I'm a very stable genius photographed it, put it on Instagram, and I think the rest is history. Uh, I think she says she has over 40,000 followers and now over 2,000 tiny pricks. Mm -hmm. And they're coming in constantly. I took the liberty of bringing uh, about 12 pieces from the Tiny Pricks Project here. They're from a group in Portland. Um, Diana was on our campus on Friday. She took a red eye to Chicago for a presentation. Um, she's going to Portland, Maine, I think today, in New York City this week. So the project is just really mushroomed. And when she gave her presentation, uh, she talked a little bit about concerns about censorship, about how Instagram, how individuals would think about that project. And in the context of Tiny Pricks, I, I wanted to ask Adele a question. Uh, you're an arts administrator. Um, I work in an academic setting, so I enjoy uh, the freedom of being able to hang the Tiny Pricks and not suffer repercussions. Is there any topic that's too hot for the Glasgow Women's Library? And when you are dealing with controversial art, how do you make decisions about what you can display and what you can't? Um, that's a very good question. Um, I feel like 
it's almost like every day uh, is a day where ethics and values are percolating through an organisation like our own. Um, I think that that's part of the uh, the deal, you know, that um, you, if you are going to say there are go-to people that you need to speak to, that it's really important that you're in active listening mode and that you are then taking on board what people are saying. So I was thinking about this, um, as I say, over the core leadership, I've been more like reflective, critical thinking mode in terms of the future, you know, how can we make the organisations that we're working in or the groups that we're working in, even if they're sort of a group of friends collaborating on, on the types of projects that I know are blossoming and proliferating in, in, in this area, uh, how can we make sure that um, we are checking in with our values and uh, making the, the, either the incremental or the seismic changes that it's our prerogative to do because a lot of the people that are determining our future are people, you know, and we're people. So it's like beholden on all of us to sort of like, if we are committed to, to values, to sort of thinking about how to make that manifest. So um, one of the things that we do, so we've had lots of uh, discussions about... Um, who funds the organisation, you know, and about corporate um, involvement and so on and so forth in the organisation. I suppose having got together as an organisation to sort of like establish what are our values, we literally do do a values check-in after every meeting. You know, so um, after a meeting that's about programming, we will have our values on the table and we will open up in a sort of like a way that's like hopefully safe for everyone to sort of talk about the values. So the values, there might be a comment from a team member to sort of say, do you know what? I feel like maybe the intern who's new today, she's not said anything. And, you know, our values say that everybody's voice is of equal value. You know, maybe we need to sort of spend a bit of time here. So it can be something that's just a lot of subtle, but then somebody says something that's like, oh, Roxy World or whatever, but also about um, values. So we've had a big discussion the last wee while about, I thought it'd be really brilliant to have Dr. Martin's fund um, an element of this work that we were doing because it was about militancy. And I think I was in Dr. Martin boots for at least 25 years of my life. And I was going through a lot of photographs of the history of the library and it was like we were promoting Dr. Martin's <laughs> collectively. And I thought, you know, time for a paper. Anyway, um, some one member of our team did some sort of deep, deeper digging and uh, I'm, I'm sure Dr. Martins are on a trajectory, trajectory that's a great one, you know, in terms of ethical thing. But there's still some areas that I just sort of think, oh, you know, I think as a team we're feeling like maybe they need to go a little bit further before we can, with our this precious, precious uh, thing that's happening here, you know, we don't want anything to sort of like mean that we find ourselves, you know, really open to being criticised for that lack of synergy with our values. So, and, and then when we look at our big and br brother and sister organisations, unbelievably febrile area in terms of, you know, if you think about the British Museum, you think about Tate and so on and so forth, my feeling is that where there's not an alignment across the whole organisation around what is the vision, what are the values, what are people's relationships to that, and everybody having ownership. You have things like, for example, Nipplegate that happened recently at the Victorian Albert Museum, where even though that place is stuffed full of nipples, it has to be said, uh, sculptural nipples, um, one woman deciding to breastfeed and one member of the team not being on message and asking that person to leave probably lost the Museum of the Year um, in the year that we were shortlisted. <laughs> but you know, but um, made way for us, which is really good. But I, I'm just sort of saying, like, I think rather than the stakes being too high to um, not do the right thing, I just feel like doing the right thing, increasingly, it's 
the only course of action because the public are now mobilised, the public are vocal, there will be a pile on. I think maybe one wee thing to sort of say is that I think that maybe some of the more difficult conversations we've had to have recently are with artists who maybe you, you might not be aware when you're working with them that actually they've got some some dissonant views about things that you might not have been aware of. So maybe we had a, a, a thing recently where maybe there was just a little whiff of something that felt like it might actually could be interpreted by our users as something that wasn't 100% welcoming to trans people. And I had to step up and ask the artist, you know, how is this? I'm not quite sure and so on. And as a result, we decided we weren't going to show the work. Um, and uh, that was part of what I think was a productive discussion with a, a, a creator. So this is new territory for me. You know, this is new territory where you're sort of thinking that horrible C word of censorship, you know what I mean? And, and so on. There's lots and lots of issues. But I feel like... Um, we need to be live to these discussions. We need to be hugely brave. We need to be, but certainly in the area of um, a critique of us for being brave and bold and risk taking, I feel like that anchor of values, it just gives so much confidence because you can communicate, you can say, this is a decision we made, these are our values and walk people through where you've got to where you've got to on that decision making and i think it emboldens the whole team you know so i don't know if that's helpful that's great or not. And thank you <laughs> I'm, I'm just looking at the time and i wanted to make sure that we gave all of you the opportunity to ask questions of adele and lucy so are there any questions from the audience and if you could speak loudly that would be great We'll try to paraphrase what you say. Yeah. I, I know this museum has done work in terms of indigenous people, and there is a huge presence on the peninsula. So would you like to speak more about how do we keep encouraging inclusion of indigenous people in making artist books and exhibits and just in our general awareness so the question for just to paraphrase is about how do we keep in encouraging indigenous people um, at this organization and within the within the greater Puget Sound area um, to participate as artists and in artist books how do we how do we make sure they're seen and valued um, I'm not the curator so I can't speak about that but I can speak about how we have featured exhibits in the past and will continue to do so. We have just, um, interestingly enough, Adele um, completed a strategic plan for the museum that talks, that lays out our mission, vision, and values. And um, creating a culture of inclusivity is at the forefront of what we're going to be unrolling this year, really focusing on that. So I see it in terms of, and we're also, another portion of it is um, valuing artists and making sure that artists feel that they are brought along, not just as singular exhibition opportunities, but brought along for a subsequent opportunity for exhibiting or brought along for a lecture or offering a workshop, connecting with other nonprofits. I think one of the very broad stroke ways that we do that is to set up a container as an organization to set up a scaffold and then to step back and allow people to people from those communities to inhabit the spaces and to tell us how to do it so um, that's one of the things that we'll be working on and this is a it's a very broad statement i know um, it, i'm resonating a lot with what adele is talking about and i certainly can't speak for um the University of Puget Sound, but I can say that the city of Tacoma, for example, just completed their Tacoma Reads program in which they featured Tommy Orange, one of the most uh, prolific and interesting writers. 
Uh, the University of Washington Tacoma has now been doing a lot of work with local artists to create public art. Uh, now has a many courses for um, recognition of indigenous people. So I think that again, it's part of what Adele was talking about, and, and Lucy as well, in terms of just increased awareness in our world about making sure that we are inclusive. And your question is already making me think, and probably some of my colleagues and friends from the Puget Sound Book Artists, are there ways that we could do outreach in our community to do workshops? I want to just uh, add, if I could, uh, just uh, Instagram is fantastic for um, being able to explore art worldwide. And so, for example, for me, um, one of the art groups that, that uh, I find hugely inspiring that do just absolutely beautiful work and, and, and very important work are the Australian Aboriginal artists. Their work uh, is a lot of patterning, and the patterning is telling uh, stories that are important to the different groups of Aboriginal people. And if you think about patterning, you see patterning You've seen patterning from old, uh, ancient. Uh, patterning follows us throughout history in every culture. It's just un absolutely universal. And when people stitch, your stitches are making patterns. So um, I just, uh, if I'm getting a little off track here, but I, th I think if we're all aware of indigenous people's art everywhere we'll see a uniformity, we'll see commonality, which I think is, is not only interesting, but important, not only for now, but for uniting us with people before and times in historical times, but now as well. I hope that <laughs> is helpful. I wonder too, I, I really value your question because I, I, you know, I'm somebody who is visiting here and that's the work that I would love to see and that's what I would be very interested uh, to come across. And I think that um, what is really critical and I suppose on our website we've got this sort of thing called, um, we do quite a lot of work called Equality in Progress and almost like giving institutions the opportunity to reflect holistically on the progress that they're making. And I think that it feels like a lot of institutions are at the programmatic stage as it were and they're including in terms of uh, representation in exhibitions but I think that the big uh, movement is to address the structural inequalities and the deep seated sort of uh, discrimination that has meant that there is no representation in on boards typically in uh, as curators in the staffing, recruitment, you know, that it's it's though that type of structural change that leads to representation changing, you know. So I, I really feel like I'm, I'm not saying this uh, a critique of the context I'm in now. I'm talking sort of globally, you know, that this seems to be an issue, and it's really interesting that you should use the example that you did because uh, the National Museum. Um, in New Zealand, I think is a in, in, in New Zealand rather than Australia is a, a model for me in this respect because I don't know if anybody's visited, but it's it's where um, there's a dual um, leadership, governance, recruitment, collections, communication, all the registers that you would want a museum that a museum functions on, half indigenous and half settler colonialist heritage you know so you've got an uh, you, there's a recognition there of the redressing of the lack of representation in the past and an acknowledgement of a history of colonization there that everybody can participate in and it's a sort of like truth and reconciliation approach really i suppose to stuff but for audiences you know what could be better really than actually having these plural voices about history and about representation where everybody's uh, role is respected. So. Uh. Thank you. Any other questions? 
We answered them all. (laughs) (laughs) All the questions. Um, That is so great, and I know many of the books upstairs reflect that, but I'd also encourage you to come see All Stitched Up because we have some wonderful books in which family stories are told. Um, A particular one that comes to mind is uh, from Nancy Bronis, who did an entire history of the WPA uh, sewing rooms, which was enlightening. Um, Judy Cook is another uh, artist who created a beautiful tribute to her family. Uh, So there are a lot of personal narratives, and I think that it's a beautiful way to tell a story. I'd love to just have a show of hands of artists in the room who are represented in in the show upstairs, too. So... So you have wonderful resources here to um, connect with while you're here at the museum. Um, I d- Jane, do you want to? Well, I was thinking, keep... could we have one final question, yeah. just kind of on a on a more um, kind of fun note? Mm-hmm. What inspires you? <laughs> what is your greatest like influence in your art, and what are you following now? Um, it's so eclectic. I will tell you, though, about uh, something that is is daily has daily inspiration for me, which I think uh, people will find interesting. And my studio uh, is in our house at, at where we live in Martinez in the Bay Area, and the room uh, was originally, before it was uh, enlarged to be at my studio, uh, was a bedroom. And it was the the so-called master bedroom. It's on the ground floor. We have two stories. Anyway, um, my mother-in-law, Ed's mom, came to live with us when she got very ill. And so she had uh, hospice care in this room. And um, where my, the main, I have, uh, a beautiful studio, and anyway, I have one of the work table I have where I do my sewing is positioned where her bed was. And she was from Estonia, and she was of the generation who could crochet anything, she could knit anything. If you said, Virva, that is a gorgeous sweater. She said, Oh, do you like that? And then <laughs> there was the sweater. She was amazing. <laughs> And she she could also satin stitch uh, embroidery. Oh my God, she was amazing, and she had a wonderful eye for uh, for color and design. And so, the last quilt she made, which went to one of our nieces, we took a photograph of, and we have it hanging in our living room. And it's just an inspiration. But most of all, when I sit. And I'm in my studio literally seven days a week. And when I'm in my studio, I'm sitting where her feet were in the bed. So I sit at my lovely, uh, unbelievably talented, uh, I want to call her stepmother, my uh, mother-in-law. So I sit literally at her feet when I'm doing my (laughs) sewing. Lovely story. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have been thinking quite a bit since I met Lucy and I've seen her work um, about all the quiet islands that we've created. And actually, um, I was thinking about the library in this respect and thinking, actually, we've created this sort of literal space there. And a lovely woman friend of mine who's, um, 
I think she's the chair of the Virginia Woolf Society International. She's called Jane Goldman, phenomenal woman. And she dropped this sort of like absolute bombshell the other day of an amazing idea and just saying, you know, you've created a room of your your own, you know, like a collective room of your own, everything. But but I have to say this because of the crochet thing that what inspires me in the library is what I've been discovering seeds of uh, on these incredible journeys that has culminated in this fabulous experience here of uh, seemingly, you know, sort of like ordinary women who are phenomenal at doing a million things, you know, and whether it's creatively or politically or, you know, sort of Diana and yourself and uh, Jane, and so, you know, um, but one uh, recent story from the Women's Library is almost like, you know, we have we have obviously political things in there, so suffragette materials and second wave feminist materials and civil rights stuff and campaigning materials. You know, we've got masses and masses of brilliant stuff, but we've also got stuff from women's domestic lives, you know, so we've got loads of crochet patterns, knitting patterns, you know, all this type of stuff. And we do get random, unbelievably random inquiries like the, the type of which you do get, you know, and sometimes it can be a bit like, oh, you know, and um, we did have an inquiry a couple of years ago that I think typifies this idea of never, ever underestimate a woman, and uh, this researcher came and just said, I'm looking for a particular crochet pattern. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, right, okay, <laughs> you know, like, right. maybe we have an intern who might be excited to do that, um, but anyway, no, 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 I don't, I don't, don't do that, but anyway, um, but yeah, she, this woman was leafing through the collection and everything, and then came down really sort of, oh, I found a pattern, I found a pattern, and I went, who is this crochet designer, you know, she held up quite a banal looking thing, she said, oh, well, actually, she's a, a Polish um, designer who designed a lot of these patterns and I said oh great and is that your particular interest and she said yes because she was a spy and um, she used to crochet uh, you know like codes into the and I don't know whether this is a a myth or not but certainly she believed it and she said I found this thing and this woman was um, carrying these crochet patterns and developing them and had this sort of espionage thing and I just thought she would pass wouldn't she I mean like an older woman with her crochet and with her patterns and she was actually just sort of doing this so I think that there's always inspiration even in something like a crochet pattern and that is amply illustrated in the work that's been done here that the histories of our moms and our grandparents and our friends and family and women, the women in, in the main who have uh, changed the world, as I said, incrementally or seismically are evident, aren't they, in all our communities. And I'm just really pleased that there's, we're using the methods, as you mentioned earlier on, the way that you're working allows people access into those massive histories you know that for some people that is the way that they start to change their views open their horizons think about things start thinking that they might actually be interested in archival work researching getting involved in campaigning groups so um all power to to us as stitches and thinkers and so, so. what a great way to end the panel please thank lucy and adele